Conversations with Germami. I'm joined by Robert Drysdale, who's joining us from Brazil. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I'm really excited to be interviewing you. First and foremost, tell us about your book. Where can we purchase your book? Yeah, the book's been out, uh, I think we came out early October, um, and it's doing really well, man. It's a dope book about the, the well, it's referred to as a book about the history of jiu-jitsu, but it's really a book about the documentary about the history of jiu-jitsu, right? So it kind of reads like a journal. And uh, I think that a lot of the conclusions that weren't going to make it into the film uh, are in the book. So I think it's, it even expands on what the film, film is able to do. Uh, now I fully understand why there's so much more information in the book format and the film format, because it doesn't matter how long the film is, you just can't do it. It's impossible. It's too rich of a story, but it's available on our website, closedguardfilm.com. So closedguardfilm.com. There's a link on my Instagram page, on the film's Instagram page. And uh, we got some posters there too. We're coming out with the Portuguese translation, Polish translation, Spanish translation, and German translation. Very interesting and very, very exciting. Now, let's dive into the, the, the documentary, the Closed Guard documentary. Give us a quick, brief sort of summary of, of, of the, document, the, the documentary, excuse me, and the film's mission and the methodology, please. Well, the story is about, you know, it, where did jiu-jitsu come from? Brazilian jiu-jitsu specifically, right? Because it's, you know, it's one of those things where everyone trains it, everyone loves it. It's a super popular martial art. I would argue it's the fastest growing martial art in the world. I don't think it's bigger than judo, but I think it's in a few years it might, you know, it's, it's growing very quickly. It is somewhat of a, it falls outside of the traditional spectrum of martial arts. I think it's got a Brazilian twist to it, you know, and I think that what Brazilians added, you know, this is somewhat of a new conclusion of mine. I didn't have this conclusion when I started, but it's still very fresh. So I'm still coming along with these conclusions. But I think what Brazilians added was more cultural than technical. And I've gotten a lot of heat from Brazil because of this. But I don't see a lot of the technical innovations came after IBJJF. But Brazilians added, you know, aspects of the surf culture, which is not traditional in martial arts. It's not Kung Fu. It's not Taekwondo and Judo. You don't see that. And I think that might have been as much as the technique is interesting. I think the cultural aspect might have been the key ingredient. Because I think people like, like those relaxed manners, right? Of course, this doesn't make into the film. This is just like my little side note to what I'm, you know, why I became so passionate about the story. Because I've always been in history and why is it like this? Out that the narrative of how jiu-jitsu had come to the United States and how it had developed in Brazil was very incomplete. I don't really like the word, you know, wrong. I think I've used that word before, but I've been avoiding wrong. I think incomplete is a better way to put it. I became fascinated by it and even more fascinated by the fact that no one knew what I was talking about. I would ask my friends, some of these guys were a lot older than me. I'm like, hey, man, you heard of this guy? He's like, I've never heard of that guy. And did you know that this guy right here did this, this, and that and taught so-and-so? They're like, man, you're lying. Where'd you come up from? Where'd you come up with that? They thought I was crazy. And I'm like, no, here's a newspaper article. I got it. It's from the 1930s. And then they go like, man, where'd you get that? I'm like, I got this in the Brazilian National Library. And they thought I was like, dude, where are you getting all this stuff? I'm like, dude, no one knows about this. It's like, what? no one knows about it. It's mind boggling. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to write a book. And then people have done it better than me. Like, I'm not going to be able to write a book. There are people who have written books on this. Said, no one reads them because they're very dense. They're not easy reads. So like, how am I going to get this story out? I'm like, let's put a documentary film together. Have I ever done a documentary? No. Any experience? No, I like, I like documentaries though. <laughs> I like to watch them. <laughs> I never thought I'd be, you know, involved in the production of one. And uh, I start pulling the strings, man. And one thing led to the other. And here we are. It's, it's really fascinating because I, I think this sort of work is really important for, for the sport of jiu-jitsu, but all martial arts, because you're right. Jiu Brazilian jiu-jitsu in particular is extremely popular and it's growing in popularity. And I think there's a demand to understand its history uh, and how it's come about. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned the theme of culture, and we'll get into that in a bit. But first and foremost, I think you might have answered it, but I'll ask you again, how has this journey in, in trying to figure out this story, how has it changed your perspective and your relationship with the sport and the culture and the way of life of jiu-jitsu? Has it changed it? How? It's changed a lot. It's a very good question. Um, it's changed dramatically, I feel like. I think, uh, you know, it gave me a, a better, more profound understanding of what it was that I was in love with. Because when you're in love with something, 
you don't think about. You're just in it, right? Whether that love is a sport, uh, a book, romantic, like it's just you're in it, right? You're in that love zone. You can't, you're not given a lot of thought. It's only after you're out of it that you go, wait a second, what was going on there? And you can, you have the vantage point of, of looking back, right? And, and, and analyzing these things. And I'm able to look at jujitsu and why I fell in love with jujitsu and why so many people fall in love with jujitsu because I have a better understanding of its history. I also have a better understanding of what the, what is going, what the sport is going through a lot right now. People don't realize because we're in it, right? So we don't see history happening, but I'm able to understand what's happening in, in a way that I think that, you know, perhaps any historian can, you know, will agree with me. Like you, you're able to see, predict better the future when you know the past and it sounds like that sounds like a lot of nonsense but i think historians are better positioned to understand the future the present and the future than anyone else because things do repeat themselves you know there's only so much about human behavior and there's only so many things that people are going to do under certain circumstances and when you're familiar with those options you know you're like okay this there's a chance that this is going to go this way or that way i i, I came out of this with a much bigger appreciation for brazilian jiu-jitsu as an art than when I walked in, like, and I, and I say this full heartedly, I, I really mean that I appreciate it on new levels, which I so frustrated when people aren't interested in history. Cause I'm always like, man, this is so rich. Why do you not want it? But at the end, it's one of those things. Look, don't give pearls to pigs. You know, if someone's not interested, I don't exist. Now, in terms of some of the discussions and, and, and the narratives that, that you've created in, in terms of like, you know, the feedback that, that you've gotten, uh, well, well, what are people telling you? so far and it's funny because the, the film's not even done but it's fascinating to witness how you've been able to engage i've seen it i've, I've seen it online on, on different platforms and i'm like this is an incredible way to market the the, the documentary which is a win-win right because you have an engaged audience but i think correct me if i'm wrong you, you're getting all sorts of different uh responses and what are they if you could tell us yeah, no, uh, it's, I, I expected, you know, when I first started talking about this with some friends, I'm like, Rob, you know, you're going to make a lot of enemies, right? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm thinking, I was like, I'm perhaps optimistic about like, no, but it, people are going to like this. This is, you know, be, and then of course, there are people that felt, man, you're going to be attacking the great stuff. It's the last thing we're doing. And, and I look, what I'm going to say next, I say sincerely, I walked, you know, out of this, you know, finishing the book and we're about to finish the film. We're a little late, but I walked out of this with a deeper respect for what the Gracie brothers did than I did when I walked in. And I mean that it's what they did is remarkable. It's, it's it, the, the interesting thing is it has nothing. They they deserve a lot of credit, but not why, not for the reasons they gave themselves credit for, for re reasons they never bragged about. That's what's so interesting. What they truly did that is truly remarkable. They never even talked about. And that's when you're like, wait a second, man, you guys did something truly incredible here and you never brought it up. Because they've always sold it on like, oh, Helio was a weak individual and he had to adapt technique. He adapted the secrets that Maeda taught Carlos. And then, you know, they created a martial art that was the real jujitsu that judo was hiding from foreigners. And I'm like, and it all smelled like nonsense to me. I'm like, that doesn't sound like history to me, you know, but I never really looked into it. Um, and then, you know, when you know, I walked out of this and you're better, you know, more familiar with the facts you find out that those things aren't true. Like Healy was not a weak individual. He was a high level swimmer um, that he gives a late comer in jiu-jitsu so that there's no evidence that Carlos ever trained with Maeda, which he might've, but there's no evidence. People don't always understand the difference, right? Me saying that there's no evidence and saying that he didn't. There's are two different statements. People think they're the same. Like, please understand the difference because I've got a lot of flack over this in the past. And, you know, there was no, like, they weren't teaching pre-Meiji Jiu-Jitsu. They had no idea what pre-Meiji Jiu-Jitsu would have looked like. They were teaching Judo. It's idiosyncratic Gracie slash Brazilian version of Judo. It's not Jiu-Jitsu. It is Judo. There's no way around it. It's just specified Judo. They specialize in an area where Judo, that Judo neglected. Mistakenly, huge, you know, uh, flaw in, in you can understand why judo did it, but I still think it was a tactical error, my opinion. But what they true, what they did was really remarkable was, you know, sticking to something that no one cared about for 40 years. Now, that's incredible because no one was paying attention. There was no money there. It was, it was just them. I mean, they were talking the 1980s and early 90s, like big tournaments, the biggest tournament in jiu-jitsu had like 200 competitors. That was their biggest competition. And that was all rooted. That, that was, that was it. 
was like 200 competitors. Imagine that. And they stuck to it. So it's really remarkable when you think about it. Um, this changed me dramatically, man. Like this look, looking back on the story, it's just, it's, it's truly an amazing story. And I appreciate it in ways that I never thought I would. I think one thing that I noticed is I think you're, you're asking really good questions and you're trying to provide context for, for people in, in order to understand the history and, and have a deeper understanding for the sport, because it seems to me like there's not a lot of room for open discussion on history, open discussion in terms of understanding and providing context. And I think this is why this film is a win-win. And moreover, you know, th there's, I think value, I've, I've heard a lot of your, your interviews, I think there's a real value when you have different camps sort of, uh, you know, saying, oh, you're anti this or you're pro this, you're anti that, because in a way you can remain objective. You are, you're telling the story based on the history that's available. You know what I mean? And you're allowing people to, you know, essentially come up with their own assessment. So I think it's, again, it's, it's a win-win for the sport. And as you mentioned, you have a deep appreciation for, uh, for th this art form. Now, who, in terms of demographics, who is this documentary for? Like, who, what's the intended audience? And why do you think this audience cares about uh, the sports, uh, the history, uh, the characters, and the contributors of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a history nerd, so I think every, it blows my mind when people don't like history. Like, what are you talking about? This is the greatest thing. <laughs> because history is about people, right? I, I think history outdoes psychology and understanding people because we're not trying to foresee what people are going to do. We're, trying, we're talking about things that people have actually done. And when we do that, we have a better understanding of who we are, right? Looking at our past. So to me, it's fascinating. But, you know, unfortunately, you understand that the market is not as big as we would like it to be. This was a concern of ours initially, you know, raising funds because, you know, we didn't want to like, man, we're going to make any money from this. Like, because it's very expensive. The documentaries are very, very expensive, far more than people think especially that ours is a pretty decent size production. So there was that concern, but, um, you know, um, I think that, I'm sorry, let's just remind me of the question. You know, I just kind of lost myself. In, in, in terms of audience, who is this film oh, yeah. intended for? Yeah. You know, if, if you look at our demographic, it's, it's a male between 30 and 40, right? So it's not the young competitor. They don't care. I can understand when you're 20, you don't care about things that old men are talking about. Right. I can understand that. that's how I was when I was 20. Um, it's majority male, uh, 30 to 40. That's our, and that's based on our Instagram following. That's what Instagram tells me. So I think it's a good gauge, right? right. Uh, but I think it's for everyone. I think the, the, the beauty of this is, you know, um, I think it's eternal in the sense where when we started, we got into this uh, documentary production, what we, it's one thing we were always telling ourselves, it was going to be archival. Because we are a very special place in, in time where these grandmasters are dying. We've lost five of them so since we finished the film, just to give you an idea, that was two years ago, and we've lost five grandmasters. Um, and you know, the you know, before that, when these grass when the many other grandmasters were alive, there were no files from the, the Brazilian National Library, you couldn't access them. So it was like a very it's like I call it the Goldilocks position. We were right there. And that small window is not going to be there in the future. So there might be better historiography about jiu-jitsu 10 years, 20 years from now, which probably will be normally how historiography works and it builds on itself, right? But the grandmasters aren't going to be there. So you're not going to get both. And I think we were in a very unique position. So we had that archival um, theme in mind. And I think because of that, it's still going to be something watchable 20 years from now. Like jujitsu, as long as jujitsu exists as a martial art, and I think there's a chance it might split, splinter into many factions, which is kind of happening already. Um, but I think people will always be interested because it does go back to the Gracie family. It does go back to Brazil. And, you know, um, say what you want about, you know, this member of the Gracie family, that member. Like, had it not been for some of these guys, we would all be doing judo. And I, I'm not, you know, attacking judo. I, I love judo. It's just that we have something different because of these people. And I think that's very, very important to remember. I think history is, history is about identity. Yeah. And, and we also have the, the UFC because of, of, of this fact. Yeah. Right? Yes. And also the martial arts. Yeah. Yeah. And people, sometimes they forget, I think Dana White is somewhat, you know, like other, they kind of, you know, they, they've never given that, that, that period in Brazil enough credit, but these guys were keeping it alive at a time when they were keeping it as real as it gets. Right. It's the UFC slogan at a time where no one cared. 
and they were doing their volitudos. I mean, these guys were making nothing and they were, they were involved in fixed fights because they had to survive. They were hustlers, man, but they loved it. The same art that me and you love. They loved it at a time when no one knew what it was. And not to honor this, these men to me is a huge insult to the sport, not just to them. You know, like there's a reason why I said this the other day, but I think it's a great point. There's a reason why, like, if you go to any American school or, you know, they, they hammer like national heroes in your head, you're going to learn about George Washington. Like, you know, there's a huge, you know, every city has got like five streets named after George Washington. Like, and, and that, that gives people a sense of identity. These men carve the way for our country to exist. Right. So I think that's important when it comes to jujitsu. We, we don't really do that. We, we, we put a picture on the wall, but that's not enough. Like you have to know your history, know, you know, where we came from to give the sport a sense of identity, because I, I, I worry, I don't think jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu, it may not last as, as long as we think it is. It's very popular right now, but is it going to be around 50 years from now? I think if it is, it's because of a sense of identity that community has as a whole, very much like judo who has that sense of identity. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu kind of has an identity, but not really. So I think this is this is a very pressing um, um, issue, like the, the historiography of Jiu-Jitsu for the purposes of the longevity of the art. I think people are, are going to appreciate th this sort of work as, in terms of telling it in, in, in the visual format, especially down the road 20, 20 30 years from now. But now we're going to segue to a bigger topic, which is Brazilian culture, because... I think, or and Brazil as a whole in terms of its history and, and so on. Um, and first, I'm going to frame it by, by speaking of, about you because you're obviously Brazilian and you're also American and you, you speak the language, you, you've grown up in, in both countries. So you have that understanding of the culture and the language. And I guess the first question on that topic is, one, how has that sort of ability to, to be both American and Brazilian and to speak the, the, the language and, and to understand the culture, how has that enabled you to tell this story in, in the way you're telling it? Has it enabled it or, or has it worked for you? Has it worked against you? You know, one thing that like, I, I mean, I grew up as a bilingual child. So, you know, I, when I remember when I moved to Brazil when I was six, I, I spoke Portuguese, but it was a Portuguese that I spoke with my mother. It's not the Portuguese that all the kids spoke. So I was like yeah. a little bit of an alien. It took me a while to adapt. And, uh, but one thing that speaking two languages will do or living in two cultures will do for that matter, having a Brazilian mother, you know, American father, is that it forces you to compare two things that are the same, but they're not. That happens with language. You have a word for one thing and they have another word, you know, in a different language. And there's, in theory, they're supposed to be the exact, but they're not. There's a little bit of difference of meaning, right? Especially things that aren't concrete, abstract, you know, uh, ideas. And it forces you to think of the same thing in a different way. And it sounds like it sounds like crazy. If you don't speak a single, it doesn't make sense. But if you speak a more, a more than one language, it does make sense. Like it's you're thinking of the same thing, but you see it from two different perspectives, right? Or three if you speak a third language. I I imagine it would be like that force people to speak even you know more than three languages. And I think what that does it it forces you to think about things in a way. But what about this? What about that? So you're always questioning: Could this be said in a better way? Could this be written in a better way? Could this be understood in a better way? And you're able to leave that framework. People have a framework of understanding the world, so you're able to leave that framework with ease. I can think of this framework instead of from this perspective. I can see it from this perspective or that perspective, right? And the more perspectives you see, the thing the better you understand the object. It's like staring at an object standing in one place versus standing at the other end. And it's something whether it was because of me being bilingual or bicultural. Um, I enjoy, I mean, because I enjoy the exercise. I love thinking about these things. I always have, I can get lost thinking about, you know, why is it that Brazil's obsessed with soccer and the United States isn't? And I can spend like a lot of time, like thinking about that. And if I read a book, it'll expand my mind further and I get anything, right? Like I enjoy that exercise. So, you know, that exercise in jujitsu came very naturally. It wasn't an effort. It was, Almost like when I got the, the jiu-jitsu bug, the history bug, I'm like, oh, wow, this is really cool. I can do this with jiu-jitsu because when I was competing, I didn't care. I was really immersed in. This is why I totally understand why someone who's 22 and is really into IBJJF tournaments probably doesn't care about the documentary or the book. But I think when they get to 30, 40, they're going to look at it differently and then they're going to go, oh, there's, there's a lot more to what we're doing than just competing. Right. And in, in, in terms of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, soccer or, or football and, and, you know, 
that c comparison is, is an interesting one because I think it's uh, it's the entire world's crazy for football. It's just, you know, North America, Canada, Canada and the U.S., that's probably not as football crazy. And by football, I mean soccer crazy as, as uh, the rest of the world. But Brazil is a very interesting market uh, for, for combat sports. As you mentioned, there's a huge history there. They, they were leading the way. They, st they still are leading the way. They're one of the most important markets in the Americas it's the Brazilian market for for the, for the UFC if you can get over there you can get over anywhere but tell us in terms of Brazilian culture what's one of the most mis and I know we're generalizing here but help us understand what's one of the most misunderstood uh, cultural issues about Brazil when it comes to to its history uh, and 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 it's it, it's culture because it's extremely diverse. People don't realize it's extremely diverse. It's got the, the largest amount of Japanese pe people outside of Japan. It's got a huge uh, Arabic uh, population from from Lebanon and Syria. It's got people from Germany, Poland. You know, it's a very it's a mishmash. And of course, the 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 uh, Aboriginal people of of Brazil. Then you've got the huge uh, African uh, population that were brought over through through sl slavery. So it's, it's a, you know, one of the most unique countries in the world when you look at its, its history and time and all that creates what we call what's called Brazilian culture. And I know I'm, I'm asking you a big loaded question here, but what's one of the most misunderstood or unknown facts, uh, you know, as, as someone who's bicultural knows and understands Brazilian culture and American culture? That's a very good question. I appreciate you asking. I think when I'm one of the few, few persons in the world yeah, that can actually do just can actually talk about both and like not sound like a hater or being like a xenophobe because I can talk all the smack I want about Brazilians or Americans and I get away with it. I, I might be hated by both sides, but I, no one can call me a xenophobe, right? But uh, there's one thing that I'll, I'll, I'll speak of because I always wanted to say this and I never got to say it because, you know, it's not something I can bring up. Right. Someone has to ask me. So right. I'm glad you asked me that question. You know, people forget sometimes that I'm half Brazilian. Like when I've been all over the world, like not just the United States and Canada, but like also Europe, Australia, other places in the world. And some it's, it's easy for people to forget that I'm half Brazilian because I don't look Brazilian. My name isn't Brazilian. You know, maybe my accent. Sometimes it comes a little bit of an accent, but normally it doesn't come out. So next thing you know, I mean, you know, those Brazilians. Yeah, man, they're all like sleazy and. Uh, they're lazy and they're and then the, the stereotype towards immigrants and i love to hear those because i'm just like oh really tell me more you know and but it comes all, all the this happens a lot man like people don't do it in front of brazilians obviously but if they're amongst themselves to get comfortable they can they'll start saying things i'm not gonna call i don't think it's racism i think it's just ignorance you know there's a lot of overlapping there but um you know, and, and they'll say stuff like this, and I'm just listening. And I love when I hear people talking smack about immigrants because it always reminds me that everyone's an immigrant, right? Who isn't an immigrant? All Native Americans were here, but even Native Americans have immigrated here at some point. Like everyone, that's the history of the world, my friend. People move. That's why we are here, yeah. right? People always forget that. But one thing they're always like, oh, they're sleazy, they're dishonest, you know? And I always go, they're lazy or they're potheads. There's a lot of stereotyping, right? And, and when it's, they don't say, they don't say that jujitsu guy. They don't say that guy with blonde hair, or they don't say that guy with the beard. That guy who's tall. They say the Brazilian, and it's like I love when they say that because it's like that's a big category. You're talking about 200 million people, you know. And I, I spent half my life in Brazil. I you know have a degree in Brazilian history. I don't feel like I'm I'm not I'm not barely comfortable enough to talk about Brazilian culture, mm -hmm. right? Because it's such a huge theme. Right. And to hear someone who doesn't speak a word in Portuguese and has never stepped foot in Brazil to make a huge judgment of 200 million people because they had three bad experiences with three different Brazilians, that's 100%, but that's a very small pool. You yeah, remember, that's a very small pool to be drawing like large, large conclusions. And I, you know, what I tell people, like, you know, I have the opportunity to say this now, that's not a Brazilian thing, that's a jujitsu thing. You know, <laughs> Americans I know that are like equally showing up late, smoking pot all day, you know, not wanting to work because it's, it, martial arts do that to people. It's kind of like being a musician, like a rock star. It allows you to be an irresponsible child while being extremely successful at the same time. Yeah. And I'm no one to talk. I live my life. When I was fighting, I was like an irresponsible child in a lot of ways because I got away with it. Life didn't call me on my bullshit. You know why? Everywhere I went, people paid me. They paid me well. They treated me nice. 
Like, you, how do you grow up when, like, the you know, you're successful in your sport or your music or whatever your craft is? And then how does life call on your boat? You don't learn these lessons, right? And eventually you do. But I, I always say this, this, this uh, resentment that a lot of, especially in the English-speaking world, have towards Brazilians is completely unwarranted. It's interesting that the foreigners who actually lived in Brazil don't feel that way. It's the people who have never been to Brazil that feel very strongly about a country they've never been to. Um, I think Brazilians are very, very hardworking people. Um, they not, they, the stereotype really doesn't fit, but I will say this. I think that a lot of what Brazil has exported in terms of the people who are teaching jiu-jitsu are not the best representatives of the country as a whole because they come from that culture of being, or that, not culture, but that lifestyle of not having to work, not having to show up on time, of being irresponsible. But because they're black belts and they're good, everyone pays them a lot of respect. So, you know, in some ways, being a good martial artist allows you to extend your teen years in a way that I think upsets a lot of people that are business-minded. Very interesting. Now, one of the ironies I find whenever I hear, and obviously I'm a fan of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for the record, but on top of that, I'm a bigger fan of, of international judo, quite frankly. And one of the ironies I, I, I don't understand is, so people are always talking about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, this, that, and the other. But what about Brazilian judo? Because Brazilian judo at the international stage, I mean, quite frankly, the Brazilian team is, is incredible. Brazilian judokas are, are renowned competitors. I mean, you could say the same, of course, about Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys. So my question to you is, uh, what is the state based on what you know? What is the, the state between the, the current relationship between judo in Brazil and jiu-jitsu in Brazil? Um, like, do they do they talk? <laughs> do they communicate? I'm sure they do because both are, are very strong and, and they both can cross train and, and, and help each other out. But uh, well, what's up with that? How come? And it's weird because, you know, I, I, I've interviewed many Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts, et cetera, and never have I ever heard anyone say Brazilian Judo. And it's, it, I find that kind of ironic. Can you shed some light on that? It's a big, you know, what you're asking is a very good question. It's a big question mark. Um, because, I mean, the reason why Brazil is so good at judo has to do with Japanese immigration. Simple right. as that. Especially, right. you know, if you look at the, the, the centers where there were a lot of Japanese immigrants, you also see a lot of gold medalists, you know, from the Olympics or the Pan Ams or whatever. So that explains that. Surprisingly, though, there's a lot been a lot less overlapping than people would think. You would think that there'd be a lot of cross training. So, for example, you think that Brazilian judokas will be experts on the ground and vice versa. But you don't always see that. And then you have guys like Flavio Canto who stands out. Like he's one of the best Niwaza experts in the history of judo, I've been told. Mm -hmm. and, but it's interesting. Like, I actually don't think he actually trained that much Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think it's been very little contact. Because if you look at his ground game in judo, it's not Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's competitive judo. Like go for the kill, 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 quick arm bars, sumigai ishi to arm bar, quick chokes. That Kanto choke he does, I have never seen anyone in jiu-jitsu even go for that choke. That's him. So I think that it's more of a coincidence that he's a Niwaza expert than the fact that he, you know, he's Brazilian. Um, and and, and, and jiu-jitsu practitioners just don't go to judo. And I think the reason for that is, is they were rivals for so long. Like judo has been seen as a rival of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Like the way, you know, even Healy on these guys would say this, Healy or Gracie, they would say like, oh, you know, um, that's not real jiu-jitsu. We do real. Real jiu-jitsu is whatever you happen to do, right? I always make fun of the submission only crowd because they're like, we do real jiu-jitsu. Yeah, real jiu-jitsu is whatever I like. <laughs> that's always real jiu-jitsu. <laughs> you know? But I, I think that they had this thing where judo was inferior in some way. It wasn't real fighting and it created a lot of tension. And I think they failed to see that what they do, what they were doing is just, I call it Brazilian judo sometimes, you know, just kind of making making fun of people. I was in, um, I taught a seminar at the, for the Cuban Olympic uh, judo team a while back. Yeah. Wow. I was there for stem cells for my knees and I, I offered to teach a seminar in exchange and they, you know, they were really cool. And their coach, their head coach kept calling it Brazilian judo. He refused to call it Brazilian judo, <laughs> which I thought was funny, but it was interesting because I guarantee you, he doesn't know a thing about the history of Brazilian jiu jitsu, but he knew enough to know you guys are just doing judo. You just got good at something that sport judo neglected. And it's like, yeah, it's true, you know, but if you told Brazilians in the eighties or even today that they're doing really judo, it's hard for them to swallow that pill because there's a sense of national pride there too, which is understandable. I think that, you know, Brazilians, um, 
they they have a sense of they don't like to hear this, but I it's, I say it it is what it is, man. Like, I think Brazilians suffer some sorts of like uh, complex of inferiority towards Americans, right? Because there are you know, another huge country in the Americas. You get you know Canada, the U.S. You know they they did well for themselves for a variety of reasons. These have nothing to do with race or ethnicity. They they really have to do historical and economic reasons, which can you can look at it like you know they 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 add up. But Brazil, is a, they call it a dormant giant, and it never lived up to its hype. It never lived up to the expectation. It never became that highly developed nation. It's largely in the shadow of the United States. So when there's something that Brazilians are better at, which are not many things in terms of sports, and you know people try to say that they didn't create anything, they get very, very sensitive. And I always tell them, like, no, this, you know, Japanese created this. There's just no way around it. But what Brazilians did was something that's also very important. Again, they added a cultural aspect. So there's nothing, you know, I don't think anyone really creates anything, to be honest. Even Jigoro Kano, he didn't create judo. He borrowed from Tenzin Shinyu. Tenjin, Tenjin Shinyu. I can never pronounce it. I, I don't speak Japanese for the record. <laughs> Keith Lurio, uh, wrestling sumo. He added ideas of education that were Western, that were not Japanese, physical education and his sport. And he picked the best of all worlds, or what he thought was the best of all worlds, and he created he created a theme of martial art. That's what he did. He didn't just create a martial art. He created a category, as we understand it today, which is no longer warfare-oriented. It is education-oriented. And, uh, education and who did that was Yigo Khan, which is astounding. When you, that's why I call him the most important figure in the history of martial arts. But I, I think it's it's a big stretch to say someone created something. I, it drives me nuts when people say that, like, even a move. If you look at a move, no one creates a move. You just adapt. You improve on it. But no one's really created anything. You know? Again, it, it goes back to the point of a real need to, to study history, to understand history, to, to kind of put things in context, as you're saying. Because you're right. No one creates things. They're always there. They just come back in style in what, one way or another. But... Uh, Going back to to the point on on Brazilian uh, judo, it's it's just I I gotta say I find it really ironic because we all know how how great uh, Brazilian jiu jitsu is, but I find in a way that the Brazilian judo community, uh, I mean, internet. Uh, if you're a fan of judo, you know. But if if only Brazilian jiu jitsu fan knew how uh, impressive the, the that country's judo was, they would probably you know, consider cross training. And I'm surprised to hear that there's no sharing of, of knowledge amongst both styles because it's the equivalent of having, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a startup, a web startup here that specializes in, in, you know, application development. And then a web startup here that specializes in marketing and audience development in, in the same building and them not talking, you know, the, the irony there is just is mind blowing yeah. because if they were to speak, it would be a win-win for all, but it's, it is what it is. So, and, and you, you know, it's just to be fair, it's not inexistent. It does. There's some cross training. It's just a lot less than you would expect. Like I have been to a few judo gyms in my life. There are guys that, you know, like Jacare came from judo, mm -hmm. you know, these guys like, you know, they, they, uh, there are others, man. I can't think Barboza came from judo. Um, and, and you, you know, could tell, you, you can tell when you watch them fight a, a lot of the high level competitors, you can tell just by, by their stance and, and their movement, you're like, it's this person clearly trained uh, yeah. some, some judo. Yeah. But you, you know what it is about? I, I think that one thing that is appealing in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu culture, it is also, it's Achilles heel. If you ask me, it's good and bad. It's both is that it's so relaxed. It's so chill. It's so bro, bra, fist bump, acai, flip flops. It's so surf culture. You can't get these guys to drill a move a hundred times. I'm telling you, if I like, you can't. Now, if they're judoka, that's a wrestler has gotten used because that's what you guys do, right? You're used to doing that. It's easier for you to continue that because that's what you know. But if you get a crowd of people and all they're doing is they're doing is fist bumping and rolling, and then you have to get them to repeat a hundred moves, it's hard, man. It's like a dog that's like been poorly trained, and it's like there's no way you can get them to go back to drilling, you know, the same move a hundred times. Now you can say, oh, it's for their betterment. If you're a professional athlete, you should. And then some people have done that, but it's a very difficult thing to insert into the culture once they're used to just doing exactly what they want to do and nothing else. I wasn't going to ask you this question, but I will now. I've noticed that there's there's a documentary on American jiu-jitsu now, 
and I think that you were interviewed in it. Can you comment on, on this documentary? Yeah, I actually haven't seen it. They did interview me for it. Um, I, I think it's just they're just trying to create pull and make it. And it does sell. Like, I don't think there's a difference. I'm watching American Jiu-Jitsu and I'm watching Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's the same thing. Like, why are you, at least with Judo in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you can see that there's been a rift, right? Like, one becomes more stand-up oriented, the other one more ground oriented. But in the case of American Jiu-Jitsu, it's really the same thing. So they're not calling it American Jiu-Jitsu because, if I understand it correctly, because they're doing something different. It's because I was taught by Americans. And the other thing is, one, it's hype. It builds polemic. People argue. It boosts the algorithm, whatever, man. I, I just like that, but it is what it is. Um, but the other thing is, and I mentioned this in my book, and this is, I've given, I've, you know, I've poked my Brazilian friends, and I'm going to do the same to my American friends. English-speaking people don't like to be second. It's something very, very ingrained in the culture. It is, you know, it's American special. They're so used to being dominant at everything that they, matters to them that they can't stand the fact that they're not dominant in IBJJF. This whole opposition to IBJJF, the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation, has nothing to do with the rules. It has to do with, if you look at the people that are very resentful and hate IBJJF, almost as a rule, there might be an exception or two, but almost as a rule, they didn't do well. So when I don't do well, whose fault is it? Oh, it's the rules. It's exactly what the Gracie family did to the Japanese. It's exactly the same thing. I, I can't win. I'm not beating these guys at their game. I'm getting tossed around. Yasuichi Ono threw Helio 32 times the first time. If you get thrown 32 times, what does that suggest? Not only that you're the guy is superior stand-up, but it suggests you're trying to stand up with them. Now, that's the important part. It's not the fact that he got thrown 22 times, but the fact that he would get back up and thrown again. He was trying to beat them at their game, and he couldn't do it. And then he got thrown 27 times the second time. So – what do they have to do? Well, we have to change the rules and we have to call it real jujitsu because what you're doing is not real jujitsu. We're doing the real jujitsu. And you change, you modify the rules to your favor and then you carve something new out of it. It's exactly what they're trying to do. But there's there's not a lot of organization. They don't, you know, the reason why Kotokan or judo became what it became is because of the Kotokan and the unity and the sense of cohesiveness that exists in judo worldwide, which Brazilian jujitsu does not have at the moment but is working to have. IBJJF, I argue in my book, shows up almost late. I think had they taken another five, 10 years to show up, there would have been the end of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It would have splintered into 50 factions and it kind of is doing that even with IBJJF in place. But I, I urge like every Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner to support IBJJF, not because they're perfect, because it has, if Jiu-Jitsu was to survive 140 years like Judo did, right, has 140 years history, perhaps will be around for another 100, I believe it will. If Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do that, it's because we have a Kodokan, and that's IBJJF. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we need like a guiding north as far as organization to create cohesiveness in the sport, create identity, right? because we're missing a lot of that now uh as far as uh and, and, and i appreciate that explanation there uh in in telling this story in, in in this documentary what is the single most significant takeaway from you I, and i know that for you i know there are many many interesting facts that you probably didn't know before you dove into this but what's that one fact that completely uh, you're a naggy you like Epon style right on, on your head. Like which one had you going like, wow, this is, which one made this journey of yours worthwhile the most? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that I learned personally. Like this is what had been somewhat of a, and I hate using the word spiritual, but like, I think a spiritual journey, you know, what's wrong some, with spiritual? What's wrong with that? You know, I, I, I don't like it because it gets associated with a lot of like, you know, supernatural. And I, it's such a big word. I, 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 I avoid using big words because you get put into categories that you don't necessarily belong. In, right. So not against I, giving one who does use it, but it, yeah. I, I, I don't want, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, if I can just say like, isn't there a component of, of, of these arts that are inward and, and spiritual in a way, like when we speak of traditional martial arts, there's meditation, there's, you know, self-reflection, there's, you know what I mean? There, there's aspects of it that, that are spiritual. Would, isn't that a fair statement? Yes, I agree. No, and, and that's, that's the sense that I mean it, right? Like something that is very like an, a, an epiphany or something that is very personal that may not make sense to other people, makes, makes sense to you. 
I, I just, I, I, I think it's too, I have, like I said, I avoid big words because they tend to stereotype you and I, I try to avoid that. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, personally, just, you know, speaking of the spiritual journey, I guess, there's an appreciation for hierarchy that, you know, I came from, um, I guess, um, perhaps like overly democratic in my youth, which makes you think that everything is, should be the same, you know, and I came, I saw something in Japan that I really appreciated. Like they have a hierarchy and it's age-based, it is uh, knowledge-based, it is not everyone is the same. And what they mean by that is not that every, you know, I, I personally believe in equality of opportunity, but not in equality of outcome, right? And I think what a lot of things, one thing that has happened in the West is we're trying to equalize result and we're losing, you know, you, you, you in hierarchy. There's no more such thing as knowledge. Everyone's an expert now. <laughs> you ever notice that everyone's an expert at everything? I'm like, maybe I do this too. Like, I don't know. But I, I don't like that. I think there should be a hierarchy. Like, and I learned that in Japan. I saw black belts sweeping the mats 30 minutes before practice without anyone asking. They swept the mats every day. I have never in my life seen that in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I came away from that very, very appreciative of Japanese culture. This is what I'm trying to say. I think it's it's embedded in their values, right? As as martial artists, hu humility, and 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 that's one thing that I find the most. Actually, as a quick uh, side note, one of the most fascinating things I find about judo as a fan and spectator is that even in their pro in the products they put out, their videos, their stories, they embed their values and and ethics and their perspectives holistically. So every time you see a judo anything a product a video and so on you know what you're dealing with you know there's no deviation there's no uh disrespect it's they, they honor their values through and through and as you mentioned before it's, it's something that's really kept that sport alive uh and and that way of life alive what was if i can ask another follow what was the most frustrating part in, in telling this story was there one particular experience that was extremely challenging or frustrating, and I'm sure there's there are many because it's a documentary, and and there's layers upon layers. One of them has been somewhat frustrating. It's a fairly new conclusion, so you know there's you know the documentary. There's going to be some of it, and more, more than there probably should be the documentary because it's in the final stages. We're not going to start from scratch, but I, I think that my conclusions have matured over time. They mm -hmm. have gotten better over time, you know, and. And this changes your perspective on things. But one thing I have a really hard time getting through people's head, um, and then people think I'm crazy, but like they don't give it a lot of thought. But I think if you follow my train of thought, you're going to agree with me. I think most people would if they actually give it some thought. Mm -hmm. Is Mitsui Maeda barely belongs in this story, <laughs> barely. Wow. And it's hard for people to see it that way because he's been at the center of the story. He's called the father of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But when you take a closer look at what he actually did, like he barely belongs. I mean, he does belong, but I, I don't think he's central. I don't think he's essential. In fact, I don't think he's any of those things. The only thing he did do is he created the environment where Carlos Gracie would be introduced to jiu-jitsu. But the beginning of Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, you know, a man called Carlos Gracie who had learned a little bit of judo here and there. And he had the ambition to be the leader. And that's what it comes down to. Like the key word here is ambition. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a product of Carlos Gracie's ambition. And you can call it good or bad. And you can call the methods not righteous. You can criticize the methods. I know I do. But it was his ambition that created all this. It really was. There's no, because, because he, he I, don't, I don't think he actually even knew that much. He knew a little bit of judo. And then he said, we're going to fight and we're going to hustle and we're going to modify the rules if we have to. And we're going to challenge them. We're going to make them want to fight us on our turf. And I'm going to train my athletic brothers to win. And we're going to be in the press all the time. And they wanted to carve out a hierarchy outside of the Kodokan. And they did that. And it was through a lot of, lot of, you know, for lack of a better word, hustling. But, like, what did Maeda actually do? Like, you know, he may or may not have taught Carlos. We don't know. If he did, it was very short. Carlos had people who we know for a fact taught him, men like Gio Mori, who was also a Kodokan man, uh, Jacinto Ferro, who was a student of Maeda, very likely Donato Piristus Hayes as well, who was also a student of Jacinto Ferro. So there are other people in this, this story. Like there are faster links and better links to the Kodokan than Maeda, if you ask me, if you really have to create a link to the Kodokan. But 
I'm just not one of those that people believe that people believe like, you know, the student is an empty glass and the master pours the knowledge in the empty glass. I think it's more complex than that. There's more nuance. There is, you know, people are learning as they go, kind of like how Americans learn in the 90s with the VHS tape. They would have a garage, some wrestling mats, and they'd buy a VHS tape called Racing Action, and they try to learn that way. Those guys are now black belts. They learn jiu-jitsu that way. They did not learn, oh, but I have a master in Brazil. You have a master in Brazil you saw once a year. Your real teacher was the math, which is the ultimate teacher. It is the math. It's not necessarily a person. And, but because people are obsessed with the, 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 the string, right, the, the, the lineage, people are so obsessed with it, they're unable to see learning from a different perspective. I don't think my it is central. The, 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 the lineage there. What is that obsession all about? Like, because, you know, I, I see it in, in many different ways, even in the marketing of, of how that's, that's communicated. And there's some value with it. But how relevant is that to someone, to a recreational grappler who just, he or she just wants to grapple because they, they want to uh, lose weight or, or be healthy or be strong? Like, is, is that, like, what's the value proposition of lineage? Like what, what value does that really communicate? I, and, and I argue this in the book, it's a very simplistic way of looking at the world. And I think that's why it's so popular because you don't have to do a lot of thinking. You don't have to do a lot of digestion. There's not a lot of reading involved. There's not a lot of thought. You just go one, two, three, four, got it. I know. And then you're satisfied with that answer and you move on with your life, right? Which makes sense. No one can be an expert at everything, right? But if you love something, my advice is you should have a fundamental understanding of it. And the more you understand this, the less important lineages are because you start learning. This is not how we really learn. Like I have my lineage too, but I, and I say this without, no, I'm not insulting anyone. I have learned more some, some training partners of mine that were lower rank than me than I did from my master's because I was going to a war with them every day. And some of the most important lessons I learned on the mats were not my instructor correcting me or teaching me moves, but me coming through the realization of something, the process of trial and error. And sometimes that was done with the blue belt. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's not an insult. That's how we, we learn like that. And what the coach really does, in my opinion, he creates a healthy environment where people can be competitive on the mats without being competitive off the mats. That's your job. It's a social kind of like a principal in a high school. <laughs> and if you can keep things, people on track, they get good. You know, that's your real job. It's less technical. And I say this because I've seen mediocre jujitsu practitioners be outstanding coaches. And I've seen phenomenal grapplers that can't coach to save their lives. I've seen them both. Yeah, so it's, lineage is just too simplistic. That's why people like it. It's it's interesting. And I, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to knock on, on the lineage. I just, I you know, I try to use that example. Like, could you imagine going to a university and telling the professor that, hey, professor, you know, that's great that you have a PhD in astrophysics, but according to your lineage, you didn't study at this university in Switzerland, therefore you're incompetent and not capable enough to, to communicate to, to these undergrad students. I, I just think, you know, and maybe that's not relevant because we're talking about academia versus uh, a martial art. But I just think sometimes, I, I wonder if these sort of notions might be culturally archaic or culturally irrelevant when, when it comes to, you know, them being transplanted into a new, uh, new, new environment. But I mean, that in itself is potentially controversial. I have one last question for you. I really appreciate your time uh, and this interesting conversation. What does it mean to be a black belt in jujitsu and what qualities do you look for in a qualified uh, BJJ coach? Um, you know, it's funny. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question before I'll tell you a quick little story. I, when I finished my book, I sent a bunch of copies out uh, to buy some friends, you know, like people like, hey, man, there's my first book, you know, there's a copy. And one of them, I had someone I hadn't spoken in a long time, was, you know, Joe, uh, Joe Silva from the UFC. And, you know, he's a very critical reader and like he, he didn't really have any critiques. He actually enjoyed the book. And, and then he goes by Rob, but like, you know, he, he said something. Now I see it as a blind spot in the book. I didn't when I wrote it. And he said, you know, martial arts don't necessarily make people better. Right. It's you see martial arts 
horrible people come out of martial arts and they're black belts and they're doing horrible things. So clearly, and I said, yeah, man, it's so true. Cause I give the impression that martial arts improves on people. Martial arts to me is one of those things. It's like religion. I think that was his analogy. It can't, or can't, you've seen religion do amazing things for people and you see them make horrible things as well. So I think what it has the potential to do is to expand who you are inside. It can make that small seed grow upwards or, you know, in, in a more negative direction, I guess. And I, I, and I agree with that. I think that's exactly what's happening. So I don't think that black belts are in the sense, they're necessarily better than the, the person. It, it is kind of like a college degree. I don't think it makes them necessarily better than anyone. It is like a college degree, so to speak, some from better universities than others. I think there is a hierarchy there, but we shouldn't be married to that hierarchy. Go back to your academic you know, I think some people, some small universities have way more brains than people that came from Ivy Leagues. You know, that happens. That does happen. But they're generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that there is, you know, better jiu-jitsu schools than others, right? In the sense where you have uh, better people to train with, right? Better coach, perhaps, better environment, better culture, all those things. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you what my criteria is for a black belt. And our, our team, Zenith, the only belt that doesn't have a belt test is the black belt because I'm judging character, and I think that's the key ingredient, man. Like, it's hard to do because, you know, no, no, I mean, I know I have my flaws and no one's really perfect, but you're trying to avoid the big ones. Like, is this guy an absolute a-hole who treats people like crap? Perhaps he's a racist. I was, I'm not going to mention what country, but like, I start talking to this guy and he was a straight out Nazi, man. Like, there's just no way around it. Like, the stuff he would say, I'm like, dude, I don't know how else to define. I, I, he wanted to be an affiliate. I'm like, no. Wow. And you know, and some people say, oh, that has nothing to do with jujitsu. He's good at jujitsu. He's a good coach. Okay, maybe he's good at jujitsu, a good coach, but he's a horrible human being. Like, I'm not. I don't want you on the team, man. Imagine a Jewish person walks in, you're going to treat him differently. Like, no, you know. So I think these things kind of matter. I am looking at your character. Like, I think that I. And again, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. No one is. But you know, you don't want to. Pe- you don't want to promote a pedophile to black belt, do you? You know, like, you don't want that guy with a black belt. There's some things that we have to screen. So I try to develop a relationship with these guys and have a. Because these guys, ultimately, they're not just ambassadors to the sport. They're going to carry on your name, too. And they're going to go, I got a, ro- a black belt from Robert Drysdale. So when they do something horrible, you know, that people look at, I literally got messaged the other day because someone who I promoted like nine years ago did something, was like yelled at her, called her a name. She found me on Facebook and started ripping me a new one because I gave him wow. a black belt years ago. And I'm like, look. I'm not, <laughs> not responsible for this, but that's how people think. They, they, they like, why did you promote this horrible human being to black people, right? Yeah. So there has to be some filtering um, over, from the, uh, over who you're going to be promoting. But I don't think it necessarily makes you an expert. In an ideal world, every black people would be an incredible human being with amazing skills. The real world is not like that. Now, last question, I'll just throw it in. Where do you see Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in 20 years? It's a crucial moment. It's a crucial moment, and I think it's 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 in the hands of every practitioner, man. We gotta stop following these idiots who insult people, and I, I blows my mind when people look up to that. I'm like, I understand why people do it in the professional environment. Like, I understand why the fighters do it. You make millions that way, okay? I don't like your logic, but there is a logic there. There is a reasoning there. It's not unreasonable for you to act like an idiot to secure your financial future for life. You know, to each their own. But when people applaud that, it's it's shocking. Like, I don't even like, how do you respond? Like, how, who on earth is looking up to this? You're telling me that you want your kids to be like that guy? Like, to me, that's, I mean, we're living in a world. I'm not, I'm no angel, man. I know it. I, I have my flaws, but I don't know. I think I know what good and bad is. You know, I think we're living in a world completely devoid of values. And Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is going down a road that I don't, it's getting worse. Um, I don't like it. But I'm one person. I, I urge people to, you know, support IBJJF because if there is hope for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it is through IBJJF, not professional Jiu-Jitsu. Professional Jiu-Jitsu it will sink Jiu-Jitsu as a martial art. They might make money because that's the immediate thing, right? That's, that's our real religion is making money. And if, if that's your only north, you're going to end up with that, but you're going to lose everything else. See, Judo set itself apart because they didn't start with the north that was money. They started with the North. It was education. It was, it was concern. We were concerned with children and future generations. And that's why they've lasted 140 years. And that's why my guess is that Judo is going to be around for another 100, 200 years. I'm not so sure about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It may well be a fad. And I think that what happens in the next 10 years of Jiu-Jitsu will decide 
if it's going to be a fad and just splinter off in like 20 other small sports, or if it's going to be a rival to the Kodokan. And that's, that's in the hands of its practitioners. But it's unfortunate that a lot of the people who are in power in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that could be making, you know, better decisions for the sport. They, they have only one thing in sight and that's making money, you know, and that's, that's problematic. Man, thank you very much for your time. This has been a, a great learning opportunity. And uh, once again, where can we get your book? Uh, closedguardfilm.com. It's, I'm, I appreciate you reaching out as a member of the judo community because I think that the judo community would really like this book. But um, you know, I don't know anyone. I've never done trained judo except like here and there a little bit. I don't, so I don't really know the community. So I appreciate you reaching out and hopefully... You know, because ultimately there are a lot more similarities and differences. People tend to focus on the differences, but if you pay close attention, I think in a lot of ways they still are the same martial art. It's just that culturally they've gone into very different directions and the rule set, of course. But, you know, I think that a lot of members of the Judy community would uh, appreciate this, um, the production, the book in general. I think, quite frankly, I think it's it's not just the judo community. I think it's people who love combat sports will, will appreciate the book. And, and the importance of, of the film in terms of telling this story. So thank you very much for, for showing you your, your passion for, for your, your way of life, which is jujitsu and, and, and you know, exploring the history because I think everyone needs to know it. And who knows, you know, 20 years from now, this is something that might be shown as reference material for, for people who, who are doing you know, their PhD in jujitsu. And then they might be citing you and your book and, and, and telling the story. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure.